I want to get right into it. The message seems very short tonight, but it seems very prophetic. And again, you know, I really don't say too many prophetic words that I believe is prophetic, but I believe this one is prophetic. Another scripture that I've never even really knew about, I guess, let me be honest. I never read it, you know, so um, God is going to move. I believe that he's going to move, whether it's today in this hour or whether when it's on uh posted or i just believe um, i believe in his word so um i'm gonna read it and then i'll go ahead and get into prayer um acts i'll be reading acts 8 i'm sorry acts 9 um verses 1 through 19 very short but very powerful powerful scripture um yeah i'll just pray right now actually um lord i just thank you i thank you so much for your word i thank you so much for your feeling of the holy spirit i thank you god that you come in and you meet us exactly where we are it doesn't matter what road we are going down father if you are pursuing us Father God, I pray right now that everyone who you are pursuing will hear your voice, whether they see the evidence of you or not, Jesus, that they would hear your voice and they will answer the call on their life. I pray that we can be strengthened. I pray that we can move forward with the call on our life, Father God. I pray right now that, that we believe in you, Jesus, that we don't just believe in the father but we believe in you jesus that you came down here for us to save us to rescue us so that we may live and that you may live i just thank you right now for your word i thank you for those disciples and prophets and the people that you put ahead of us to be examples for our lives whether we think their examples are not you place them there for a reason father god so i just pray right now that every heart is opened father god that your spirit holy spirit is just resting and hovering over this bible study tonight so that we may be filled with your word and baptized and filled with the holy spirit in jesus name amen Amen. Um, so, um, Acts 9, 1 through 19. Um, it says, meanwhile, oh, I just love, I don't know, I guess when you read the word, you just start to really enjoy it. But it says, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, Jesus, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you? Lord, Saul asked, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hands into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called him, the Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem, and he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, 
This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to those house, went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother, Saul, brother Saul the Lord, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Just so good. Just uh, so good. I'm going to get right into it. Let me tell, well, if you don't know, I guess, let me tell you about Saul because I really didn't know too much about him, just the fact of what everybody has said. He wrote like a third of the scriptures or something like that. I don't know. I haven't found that out by myself, but that Saul's name was changed to Paul eventually. But Saul was one who persecuted the church, the church, God's holy people, the church, you know, um, God's chosen, you know, you know, killed and persecuted and imprisoned God's people. So Saul was on his way to Damascus to imprison God's holy ones. So um, persecute, when I look up the word persecute, um, it already sounds like a horrible word, but persecute is hostility. It's ill treatment based on what you believe based on, you know, religion or race or anything like that. That's what a host, that's what persecute is. It's just hostility, ill treatment based on your background of what you believe or, you know, so Saul was just not like this, got this follower of Jesus, if you will. He was not saved. Saul just persecuted the church. So Saul's journey, he was on his way to Damascus to imprison God's holy one. But Saul, when he was found by the Lord, he said he called him Lord. But sometimes there is a difference in who is speaking. Yes, they are the same person. God, the Lord, Jesus Christ, it's the same person, Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, the same person, it's a trinity of three, but they are also made up of different names. So when you are in a different environment or a different situation or a different encounter, that will be the way that you know how to identify who is speaking to you. Saul did not know the Lord for Lord, so how could he call him that? Saul did not know him for that. Like, for example, if, if my sister, if one, she's my sister, she knows me for being my sister. If we have an encounter with my sister at, a, or say she's, she works for me and I'm her boss. Now she knows me for being her boss, but it doesn't change the fact that I'm her sister, right? So just because Saul doesn't know him for Lord and say Saul might know him for being whatever he's persecuting the church for. That's what he knows him for. That's what, that's all he knows him for is for whatever reasons he was persecuting the church. He believed it and he persecuted God's people, which means he was persecuting him. When Jesus went to him, he said, why are you persecuting the church? Why are you persecuting me? If you are a part of God's holy people, his chosen people, the ones he set aside, the ones who are called, the ones who follow him, any like anybody who says something against you, like if the Lord is for you, who can be against you? Like if anybody says something towards you, they're saying something against the Lord because that's who you represent. That is who you follow. So just because my sister knows me for sister, the environment can change if she starts to work for me and now I am her boss. Now she knows me for her boss. And that's the role 
that I will have to play in her life. So she would have to get used to knowing me in such a way that she has to sometimes take sister and put that to the side to now walking into this new environment and be submissive, if you will, to the fact that I'm her boss. So you can know somebody in one area, but not in another. We can know God in one area, but we can also not know him in other areas as well. Saul questioned which part of God is speaking to him. That's why when he said, who are you, Lord? You know, he questioned who was speaking to him because he only knew him for the reason why he was persecuting the church. So again, God is made up of many different names. That's why we call him healer when we need a healing. That's why we call on Jesus when we need a savior. We know him for all of these different names, but we got to be honest of the names that we know him for. We can't say like, if, I, if God has never healed me, but he's healed my mother and I may not know him for healer, I cannot call him that because I really don't know him for being a healer. That would just be a lie. But I've seen it happen for somebody else, but there's no evidence for me. So I'm just going to keep you. I'm just going to call you Jesus because I know that you saved me. I'm going to call you Jesus because I know that you're my savior. I know what you did for me way back when. So I know you for Jesus, but that's how magnificent and great he is. He has many different names in this three trinity, if you will. So Jesus didn't refer to Saul as Lord. He referred to Saul as Jesus because he wanted to save Saul from what he was doing to his church and really what Saul was doing to him. Saul, again, didn't know him for Jesus. Saul didn't know him for Lord, but Jesus knows exactly what we need. He meets us exactly where we are. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what road that you're walking on. When God is trying to pursue you, he will meet you where you are in your mess, in you going to do something that you shouldn't be doing. He will meet you where you are. In your trouble, he will meet you where you are. In your sex drive, he will meet you where you are. In your stealing, he will meet you. In your lying, he will meet you where you are because he wants to pursue you. When God is pursuing you, he's going to meet you where you are because he has something for you. So he heard Jesus, but he couldn't see him. Sometimes we can hear of him and not believe in him. We can hear about all of these wonderful things that Jesus has done in our lives or in other people's lives. But that doesn't mean we believe in him. We can hear his name, but we believe in something else. We may know that he's there. We may know that maybe he's not there. We may know that he's the one who died, but he may not be the son of God. We may, we may not really know him fully, but be, and it, it's sometimes it's because we don't see the physical evidence. I'm sorry, I'm trying to get us into it slowly. But sometimes we hear of him and don't believe in him because we don't see physical evidence of what he's did in our own life, which is why we can't call him something we don't know him for. Like, I don't think, you know, he wants us to call him something we don't know him for because it leaves no room for him to be that in our lives. If we don't know him for healer, we, know, we don't want anything to happen to our body, but we say, God, we want to know you for healer, which it could be a stomach ache. It can be a headache. It can be through your children that you see that he is the healer in your life. But it doesn't change the fact that that's his name. Even if he's not that for you, it doesn't change the fact that that is his name. Like I can go change my name. But that doesn't change the fact that I had a name and that is my name regardless if I go and change it 
or I can be a woman, but it doesn't change the fact if I want to go change to a boy that I'm still a girl. No, I am a woman. I am a girl. It doesn't change. God's names doesn't change either. He is the almighty. He is Jesus. He is Lord. He is the first and the last. His names don't change. They honestly get bigger and better and better as we learn to know him and become in relationship with him a little bit more. But just because we don't see evidence, it doesn't mean that that's not who he is. We just don't see the evidence so we don't know what to call him. I think Saul was in that position. He doesn't know what to call him because of what he believed, because of the lies he was told. So Luke 6, it said, you don't have to go to it, but Luke 6 says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? That's why we cannot jump ahead and skip over who he currently is in our life because he's everything we need him to be and more. He, he's going to be that, but we don't need to skip over and call him something that he's not in our life. So if he's not your Lord, I would not call him Lord because then he has a word for you. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but don't do the things that I say? Saul called him, who are you, Lord? But Saul's not doing what he says. So don't call him who you don't know him for or know him to be. But you can hear it. You can still believe it. But sometimes we don't know him for what we are calling him for, but he wants to be what you are calling him for, but he's also not going to have you skipping over a, his name when you haven't even been saved yet. You're calling me Lord, but you haven't even been saved yet. And you don't know that Jesus is speaking to you. Saul said, Lord, but it was Jesus who was speaking to them again, same person, but it's a different environment, a different encounter. Saul's not saved. The way to the father is through the son. For, so Saul has to know him for Jesus first before he starts calling him Lord. So as we continue to go on our journey of being pursued by the Lord or just being hungry for him. I don't know who's hungry for him, but just being hungry for more of Jesus. I want more of you. I want more of your wisdom. I need more of your understanding. I need more of your light. I need more of your word. I need more of you. That's that hunger for him. Clearly Saul was hungry for him because again, we have to be willing vessels. Jesus knew that he was willing. In some shape, form, or fashion, he had to be willing to answer the call on his life. But Jesus first has to set the stage. When he's pursuing you, if you guys are taking notes, I want you to write down these three things. If he's pursuing you, he first sets the stage to prepare for you. So first, when Jesus sets the stage for, for Saul, he causes him to lose his sight. Sometimes there's too much anger and frustration and pain and hurt and distractions and lies that's been told to you that he has to now rid you from seeing what's going on around you so that he can make sure you get to the place that he has prepared for you. He has to blind you, cause you to lose your sight so that you won't be distracted from what's going on around you. He has to prepare you. He's pursuing you. Saul had to be blinded because he needed to be led, which leads me to number two. You have to be led. When God is pursuing you and there is a call over your life, on your life, you have to be led. We can't think that we step into a call of God and not have somebody to lead us. We don't know what we're doing. We don't know the right way. So God has to send people our way to lead us and guide us so that we can go to the place that he has called us to. 
because you have blinders on. That's why you have to be led. You have blinders on. You cannot lead yourself and even at this point, trust yourself to lead yourself and know where God is taking you. So he has to appoint certain people to help lead you and guide you. The same people when Jesus was speaking to you, Saul, the same people that were there are the same people are the ones that are going to lead you. Saul was being led by the men that were with him until Ananias came. Number three is that when God is pursuing you and now you have been blinded and you don't know where you're going, so you need somebody to lead you, you should go into a fast for three days, specifically not eating or drinking anything and praying. Verse 11 said that he's, he, start, he was praying, that Ananias was, will find him because he will be praying. But then he also withheld from food because he did not eat or drink anything for three days. Again, this is a prophetic message. So if, it, if, if it's for you, then I would receive this message. Fasting for three days when you know that God is on your tail. You know something about him. You know that you've been called. You know that you've been chosen. You know that the life that you live is not the life that God sees for you. It's not the life that he's envisioned. It's not the life that he planned for you when he knew you and before in your mother's womb. This is not the life that he's lived and called you to. So when he's pursuing you, you will be blind. He'll cause you to lose your sight. You have to be led. And then you should fast for three days, fast and pray for three days because you should fast for three days. It's because you relied on the things around you to guide you and lead you. And those things were not sent from God. You should fast. The things that's been leading you, the things that's been guiding you, those things can no longer lead you. Those things can no longer guide you. You should fast. Saul was led by the wrong thing. And specifically what God was saying to me was lies. So whatever lies that you have been believing and you assume that they were the truth about Jesus, they're not the truth about him. You can believe in who he is. You can believe that he came and he died to save you. You can believe that he is the son of God. You can believe that he is the resurrection. You can believe that he is the life. You can believe that he is the way. So I come against any lies that's been said to you and have taken root into your mind and into your heart to where they bear the wrong fruit. Sprung up the wrong fruit, should I say. So Saul believed the lies Whatever he went through, I didn't even get into who Saul really was, but there's a reason why you persecute the church. There's a reason why you don't want to tithe. There's a reason why you don't want to step into, into the church. I'm starting to realize when the preacher starts saying that, that you got a problem, you want to go, you don't want to go in the church because of what they did and stuff like that. Like there's a reason why you're persecuting the church. You got to learn to forgive. You got to step back into the church and forgive. You got to be a tithe because it says so in the word. Whether you believe it or not that somebody may have wrote the word or anything like that, you got to get back into doing the things that God has said for you to do. Tithing is of God. Believing Jesus before God is of God. It's the word of God. So whatever lies that you have been believing about the name of Jesus I bind them in the name of Jesus because they're wrong. It's not the truth. So evidently saw that he saw thought that he was going the right way. Like some of us, sometimes we don't take time to pray. Sometimes we don't take time to pray in the morning saying, God, where are you leading me today? Where are you guiding me? Where are you guiding me today? Lord, I surrender to you today. When he said in his word for us to pick up our cross daily, it, it was literally meant that we pick up our cross daily. God, I surrender to you. 
I don't know what you want to do for me today, but I want to do whatever your will is. Let your will be done in my life, God. I want to follow you. Who I need to speak to today, I'll speak. What I need to withhold today, I'll withhold. Where I need to go today, I'll go. We need to follow the Spirit. We need to follow Jesus. So every day we need to be picking up our cross. It's a daily walk. It's a daily pursuit. We'll never be there until the day that he returns. It's a pursuit. It's a race that we never stop running. We never stop moving. We never stop going forward. We never stop pursuing our father. It's so much to him. We can't just sit and be comfortable with who he is in our life for right now. He said that there's better days ahead of us, not in back of us. We have better days ahead of us. So Saul, like some of us, we think that we are going the right way because we are not asking, Lord, what is your plans? What is your will today? What do you need me to do? He thought he was going the right way, but God had other plans for him. And it's crazy because he was on his way to Damascus, but because the Lord meets us where we are, he was on his way to Damascus too. The Lord was on his way to Damascus too, to meet Saul where he was. So you can walk down the road that you want to walk walk down. You can do the things that you don't want to do or that you do want to do unwillingly or willingly. You can do all of those things, but God will meet you where you are and he will put you on your face so that you'll know it's him when he comes and he has that encounter with you. You can deny it or you can pursue it or you can agree to it, receive it, but he will come meet you where you are. That is the kind of God that we serve. That is the kind of Jesus that died for us, that saved us, that rescued us, that defeated hell in the grave. He is that God. So whatever you believe that goes against what he said, we take captive every thought that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. So, we have to understand that God will send people our way, specifically in this text, disciples. There are disciples all over the world here in our day. It's not just the disciples here in the world, um, here in the word. There are real life disciples in this world, in this world. God will send disciples your way to disciple you. So that's a part of preparing you. That is a part of the preparation. You're not ready to just go out and lead somebody. You're still blind. You're not ready to go out and speak the word. You're not ready to go out and do the, the great things that God has called you to because he's called you to great things because he is a great kind of God. You're not ready for that, but we must be discipled by those who God puts in our life so that we can answer the call of God. He don't just give you a call and not give you any instructions regarding the call. Like he don't just give you the job without somebody training you. That's real life. You don't just go on a job and then just start working, whether you got the experience or not. You have to be trained by someone to do the job that the manager or the owner or whoever your supervisor is. You got to be trained before you can step into that role fully without your trainer. And that's a period of time. That's not something that's overnight. It's a period of time. Let God, let God make room for God to give you that period of time if this is your word. Let God give you, make room for God to, to give you what you need. We can always rush and say, we want to be here. We want to be there, but God wants to disciple you right now because there is a call on your life. There is a call on your life, but you have to be discipled to answer the call. So when there is a call of God on your life, expect to be blind, expect to be led, Expect to fast and pray. Expect to suffer. He said that Paul is going to know. Saul, excuse me, I keep saying Paul because that's what I know him for now. But he said that Saul, 
he's going to show Saul how much he must suffer for his name. Expect to suffer for the name of Jesus. There's going to be suffering. There's going to be fasting. There's going to be you being led because he has called you to be a chosen instrument. Isn't that good news when God is, he could have chose anybody, but he has called and chose you. He pursued you. When you were doing wrong, he pursued you. He called you out of where you have been. He is pursuing you now and calling you out of where you have been because he has called you to be a chosen instrument. Again, he could have chose anybody, but he's chosen you. The least of who would we, we in our world would think to be chosen. We choose the most beautiful. We choose the one with the best hair. We choose the one with the best skin. We choose the one with the best smile. We choose the one with the best. But when God sees us and God chooses us, he chooses what we think is the least. But that's not what he sees. He don't see you as the least. He sees you as a chosen instrument. So before you can answer the call of God on your life, you must believe in Jesus. The word says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That no one comes to the Father except through him. You cannot answer the call of God on your life if you do not believe in Jesus. If you don't believe that he has come and died for your sins, to save you, us. We cannot get to the Father. We can't skip over Jesus and say, well, I believe in God. We must believe in Jesus if we are gonna answer the call on our life because Jesus is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. Anything other than that is a lie of the enemy. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. If you're going to answer the call, you must believe, put your hope and your belief, your faith in Jesus. His name is Jesus. You must believe in him if you will be saved. You cannot skip over Jesus to get to God because God will say he never knew you. You'll be standing in front of him saying, I will, I called you Lord, Lord. You'll be standing in front of him saying, well, God, I prayed in your name. God, I fasted in your name. God, I was blind in your name. But he say, I'll never knew you because you did not believe in his son, the son that he sent to save you, the son that he sent to die for you. You didn't believe in him. So there was no way that you could enter into his kingdom without believing in his son first. So if you're going to answer the call of God on your life, you must believe in Jesus. The word says that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. You can't get through God if you don't come through Jesus. Get to God if you don't come through Jesus. It's crazy because this is how you know maybe you're put around the right people is the relationship they have with, your, with, with God. Ananias, when, when Jesus came to Ananias, he was Jesus. I'm sorry, when Jesus came to Ananias, he was Lord. When Jesus came to, to Saul, he was Jesus. Ugh, God knew Saul needs saving. He cannot be his Lord without him being saved. Saw Ananias was already saved. That's why he knew him for, for Lord. They had a deeper relationship. You're going to build a deeper relationship. You're going to go from Jesus to Lord. You may not be able to call him Lord yet until you make the decision to believe in him. But you're going to be able to call him Lord. And you're going to be able to call him Father or call him God or call him deliverer or call him restore you're going to be able to call him that but you got to get through jesus first you got to believe in his son you got to confess who he is you have to believe 
who he is. And that was just mind blowing to me because he is one thing to one person and another thing to somebody else. It doesn't change the fact of your relationship or what your relationship is going to be or that that relationship is better than that relationship. If you want the relationship with Jesus, if you want the relationship with your Lord, your father, then you pursue that. You seek after him. You pursue him. You knock at his door. You keep on knocking. You keep on seeking. But that was just so mind-blowing to me because just because he's one thing to somebody else doesn't mean he can't be it for you. He was Jesus to Saul, but he was Lord to Ananias because of how deep their relationship is. And God wants a deeper relationship with you. Jesus wants a deeper relationship with you. He wants a relationship with you. Let's worry about the deeper later. He just wants a relationship with you. He wants you to be able to call him Jesus. He wants you to be able to know him for savior. He wants you to be able to step into a room and be confident that you are saved, that you are going to heaven, that you are not going to hell. He wants you to be confident. He wants you to know where you are going, where you're going to spend eternity. I ain't never preached a message like this, but he wants you to know where you are going to spend eternity. He wants you to be confident in him. He don't want you to skip over Jesus and start calling on God. He wants you to start calling on Jesus, but you got to receive the call because you're hungry. He told me you're hungry. He told me that you're seeking. He told me that you're searching. He told me that you're just trying to find any which way, but there's lies going on in your mind that you are still believing. Those lies that we are rebuking tonight. Those lies that we are binding tonight, the lies that we are sending back to hell tonight. He told me that you're believing lies and because you're believing lies that you won't believe him. Whatever it is that you heard, whatever it is that you know about him and it's not good and it's not right and it's not in his word and he didn't speak it to you. It's a lie from the enemy because he wants to keep you. He wants to keep you locked up. He wants to keep you chained. He wants to keep you in the toxic relationship. He wants to keep you doing things that God never told you to do. He never spoke to you and said, do that. But you were so confident that he did. And he didn't ask you. He didn't tell you to do it. Ooh, this word is so good because I know somebody's chains are breaking. That's why we listen to break every chain. I know somebody is coming out of bondage. I know somebody's lies are being turned into truth. He already told me, I know that you are coming out of your shackles and you are going to be able to walk through the sea that he has parted for you. I know it. I don't know if it's for anybody on this message, but he will get it to whoever it needs to be to. If it's for you, if it's for you, receive the message. And if you don't know Jesus, know him tonight. He is pursuing you tonight, right now, right where you are. You ain't even got to change. Saul was on his way to Damascus. He didn't make time to change. He didn't say, I'm going to do this and do this. No, God, Jesus pursued him and he met him right where he was. He is meeting you right where you are. So, ooh, thank you, God. Thank you, God, that he pursues us in our mess. Thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he is somebody we can call on to be our savior. Thank you, because ain't nobody else going to save us. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for our father sending his son to die for us and set us free from the chains and the bondage and the shackles. We ain't got to follow the way of the enemy no more. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. We got to answer the call on our life, but we must start with Jesus. We thought we was on a road going one way, but this was a divine interruption. God told me that this is a divine interruption into your life, that he is stopping you on your road to Damascus. He is stopping you from whatever, making whatever decision that you're about to make. He is stopping you in the middle of your tracks, in the middle of your road. You thought you was going one way, but he got plans for you to go another way. He's pursuing you. Because he has plans for you. He has called you a chosen instrument. And he ain't, don't, he probably know plenty of other ways, but there is not another way to say it. 
There is not another way to save it. You got to believe who you are in God. You have to believe who you are. You got to believe that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You got to believe that no weapon formed against you will prosper. You got to believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life. You have to believe it. Nobody can believe it for you. But we have a God who is patient, a God who will continue to pursue you until you are on your deathbed. We have a God who is patient with us. And he is calling you to serve his son so that you can have life and have it more abundantly. So that you can just have life. Let's just have life. Let's not be in the same mess that we are steady being in, hitting our head on the wall because we keep going back to the same thing. We keep showing up the same way. Ain't nothing changed. Our emotions ain't changed. The way we treat people ain't changed. It's just God is calling you to a higher living, a better living. He is calling you to his holy place. There's this song I'm going to want to give you guys afterwards. I should have said it before, but it's been on my heart. But Jesus, just know that Jesus is setting up a divine interruption to get you baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, this is so prophetic. Receive it if it's your word, because we don't know if we get another day. We don't know if we get another hour. We don't know if we get another day to see our kids or another day to be in our marriage. We don't know if we get another day to take another breath. We don't know what God has in store for us. So receive this divine interruption for your soul, for your spirit, that God, Jesus, he wants to baptize you and fill you with the Holy Spirit. Saul was baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit when Ananias came. We thought that we were on our, our we had an agenda to fulfill on our own way that we were going. But God said that we can make plans, but that his plans will prevail. Whatever way you're going to go, he's going to meet you there. You're going to hear him, but it's your job to decide. It's your job to believe. It's your job to be led. It's your job to fast and pray for the three days. It's your job. He can't do it for you. He's just going to meet you where you are. He's going to let you know that this is, is a divine interruption on your life for your calling so that you can be filled and be baptized by the Holy Spirit. So we can walk whatever road that we want to walk on. He's going to supernaturally interrupt it all. He's going to supernaturally interrupt all that we thought was about to take place. The Lord knows exactly what we need. We think we know what we need. But if Saul thought that what he needed was to go to Damascus to imprison God's holy people, maybe it would have fell through. But our Father, our God, our Lord, our Jesus... He knows what we need, and because he knew what Saul needed, he brought him the Savior. We can say that we need all of these things, but the one who searches hearts, the one who knows hearts, the one who knows what you need will give you what you need. It came to me like our children, they have a whole bunch of wants, but we make sure they have food and clothes and everything they need. So you may have a bunch of wants in your life. You may have a bunch of wants, but the one who knows what you need is on the way. He's already went ahead of you. He knew that you were going to A, B, C, or D, or all the way to Z. He knew where you were going. He knows your situation. He knows what you're sitting in. He knows what you're tired of. He knows what you're doubting. He knows what you're worried about. He knows what you're confused about. He knows what you heard about him. He knows the lies. He knows it all. But he's already went ahead of you to meet you on the same path that you're going to walk down. 
So you're going to walk down that road that's not for you. And that's the road that he's going to meet you on. Sometimes we find ourselves in situations and we get ourselves in situations and we know that we ain't supposed to be in this situation. And that's the situation that God is going to meet you and have an encounter with you in. That one that you want so bad, but it's because you need something else. So it's coming out as a want. It's coming out as a desire to do this because you've been hurt, because of the trauma, because of the pain, because of your past, because of what you went through, because of what you won't let go, because of unforgiveness, because of lies. It's coming out as a want. But God knows it's a desire of a need that you really have. You have these temporary wants, but once he give you this permanent need, you're going to thank him for the rest of your life because one touch from God, I don't care if he made you blind in this season, that one touch can change your life, change the trajectory of your life. All you need is one touch, whether he blinds you or whether he heals you, you need one touch from the one who is called Jesus, the one who is called Savior we always think we know what we need, but he knows what we need. He doesn't leave us with needs. He said that he will supply every one of our needs and we got to believe it, which means we got to make some sacrifices. Saul could have kept going to Damascus, but we got to make some sacrifices so that our Lord, our Savior, our Jesus can give us what we really need and not just the temporary wants. He wants to give us something more permanent, something more everlasting, something more foundational. He wants to give you life. He wants to save your soul because the route that you're going is not the route that you should be going. That route to Damascus is not the route for Saul. Later in this scripture, Saul had plans like God had many magnificent and amazing things that Saul has did before he changed his name to Paul. He became somebody that was a disciple. He was going, he was teaching, he was speaking to false prophets or, or sorcerers. He was speaking to those people. He was being used by the Holy Spirit. And that's the same thing that God wants for you. He doesn't just want you to be a free spirit, a free soul, just out here walking, thinking, oh, well, I'm okay. I'm saved, but not if you don't believe in Jesus, you're not. And I'm sorry to break it to you because that is hurtful. But it's hurtful to be in hell or is it hurtful to know where you're going? We have to believe in Jesus so we'll know where we are going. We are all going to go where he has called us to go. Like, we can learn so much from Saul because, again, he was the least unlikely to be chosen in my eyes. I wouldn't have chosen him. I would have picked somebody who was upright, somebody like David. I would have, you know, just in this human life, in this human world, you pick somebody that's, you know, they don't even want to hire the ex-cons when they go on a job the felons because they want somebody who's upright somebody with a degree somebody with a diploma they can't even see past somebody's faults do you want to be like that god sees past your faults how good is he he sees past your faults whatever you did adulterer he sees past it he calls you saved he calls you free he don't call you that name no more he calls you a new name. He calls you a chosen instrument. So whatever name that somebody else gave you, whatever name somebody called you, whatever name that you've been calling yourself when you look in the mirror or when you take a picture or when you post it on your social media, whatever name that you're calling yourself, God calls you something different. We can't even fathom sometimes the name that God wants to call us and how he wants to use us and where he wants us to go and how he wants our life to be changed and transformed. We can't even fathom it sometimes. But Jesus knows exactly what you need. And if you are here, 
He is saying that you need a savior. I don't need to know. I would like to know if there's one who doesn't believe in Jesus. They just believe in the thought of God. They believe, you know, that, you know, God gives favor and God gives blessings. And, you know, God has kept me out of a divorce or God has, you know, rescued me or I want to come against that lie because you can't just believe in the father. You really don't even know him. If you don't believe in Jesus, you do not know God. That's the harsh reality. You've been praying to somebody, but who have you been praying to? Because if you don't believe in Jesus, you haven't even stepped foot into the presence of God nor for him to answer any prayer. And prayers may be seeming like they're answered, but the enemy gives answered prayers too. So if you do not know Jesus, I don't want you to leave off this Bible study without knowing him. He said that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus, 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 Jesus is Lord, then we will be saved. Jesus wants you to be saved. Jesus wants your soul to be saved. It doesn't even matter that you may backslide the second day you got saved. He's still after you. Long as you just got to believe it in your heart and confess it with your mouth. Because we all make mistakes. We all fall short of his glorious standards. But long as you believe that you are saved, long as you believe in Jesus, because he is the way, the truth, and the life. Long as you believe in him and confess who he is. Once you confess who he is, that tells Satan, I am no longer yours. I, you're not even in control of me anymore. I can be released from these chains. The chains are broken, Satan. I no longer have to live that way, Satan. You don't have control, you don't have dominion, you don't have authority, you have no reason to keep me here anymore if I believe in Jesus Christ. You can't control me anymore. You may tempt me, but I have a father who says he will give me a way out in the midst of temptation. I have a word for Everything that you will come against me with, Satan. I was hearing this week that once you believe, because I know that you will, that you need to put on the full armor of God. If you don't know where to start, I'm here if you need to talk. I'm here if you need somebody. Mama Lisa is there. Mama Michelle is there. Uh, Tatiana's there, Khadijah's there, Bree, you're there. If whoever it is, and, and more right woman that's on the chat, get with somebody if you don't know the next step. Like he said to put on the full armor, peace as your shoes, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the spirit, piercing between bone and marrow, sharper than any two-edged sword. That's the word of God. And the shield of faith, put on your full armor to stand against whatever is coming at you from the enemy. Put on your full armor that we are praying, I'm praying for the right woman as a whole and specifically when God tells me a specific name but that we have to put on our full armor because the enemy is coming back to get you. He's coming back to get what he stole. I mean, what he lost. He ain't going to just let it go that easy, but he's not more powerful than our Lord. He's not more powerful. We don't give Satan that much credit. We don't give him the credit. We don't give him the time or day. He is not more powerful than who we serve. And I'm just praying for you that you will give your life to Jesus because you can't go through, you can't get to the Father without going through Jesus first. He's pursuing you. He loves you. It don't matter what you did years ago, yesterday, tonight. It don't matter what you did. It don't matter what you have plans to do. Because Saul had plans too. 
We can learn so much from him. He will meet you where you are. He will meet you exactly where you are. And I just pray that you will answer the call of God on your life. That whoever Jesus wants to put in place to surround you to be discipled. And discipled is basically like a, you know, a teacher. They're just teaching you the way to go, you know, when to read or how to read or praying with you, uplifting you. Uh, if you don't understand scripture, maybe helping you out. It's just somebody that you can be in fellowship with so that you are not in fellowship with who you used to be in fellowship who may have got you here in the first place. So I just pray over your spirit and your soul that you will answer the call of God on your life. If he told you face to face that you were a chosen instrument, I would think that you would answer the call. Sometimes God gives you a call on your life and you don't even know what's ahead. That's the mystery about him. We always got to know what's next. Okay, if I, if I choose you, God, okay, what's going to happen next? Okay, it, it's a mystery when you find yourself in the presence of God. When you find yourself believing in Jesus, there's a mystery. You're not going to know the next steps sometimes. He's not going to give it all to you like a vision board. He's not going to just lay it all out for you like a red carpet. He wants you to pursue him so you can get the answer. He wants you to stay in school so that you can get what you need, the knowledge and the wisdom and the understanding. That's what he wants for you. So I believe in this word, of course, I believe that it was definitely prophetic. I believe that if you know someone, when we repost this and they may not believe in Jesus, but they believe in God, you'll know, they'll tell you. You know, do you at least believe that he's the son of God? Yeah. Do you believe that he died on the cross? No, I don't believe that. You know, it, you, people will tell you, if you will, if you just ask, everything you do, let it be out of love. He said, let everything you do, whether it's this or that, let it be all for his glory. So I just want to pray before we um, get out. But if anybody has anything that they want to say, um, please just, please, you know, you, you, you have definitely have the full floor. Um, if not, you know, we'll pray out and, um, oh, excuse me. And then, um, and then we'll go. Maybe you want to, to pray for somebody, you know, maybe a name that, you know, you know, who doesn't know, and you may, you may just get maybe a feeling of, okay, maybe they don't believe, and there's a name on your heart that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now. Um, maybe the Holy Spirit is urging you to confess or urging you to um, repent or just touching on you a little bit, you know, um, I don't know, but I know that was prophetic. And God doesn't just leave us where we are. He doesn't just leave us how we are if it doesn't please him. So, um, that's crazy. Like, when you start to read more of Saul's story, he persecuted God's holy people, and I believe he got persecuted the most in the word. Um, I can't confirm that, but as I'm reading, it seemed like he was the one who was persecuted the most, that he's the one who may have suffered the most. Um, you know, when he went to the uh, sorcerer, he was calling him like, you know, the child of uh, the child of Satan. You know, but when I was looking at that story, it was pretty much everything who Saul was. So sometimes we find ourselves even having an encounter of who we used to be so we can save the person who we used to be. Like we used to be that, so why leave them where they are? That's how we know that we're growing. That's how we know that we are maturing. When we see somebody who we used to be and we ain't, we ain't forgot, it, 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 it brings out a love in, in, in you. Um, you know, so, yeah. 
anybody has anything if not we'll just pray out and i'll give you a last one to say hello y'all hey my Hi, sis. <laughs> It's tight, but it's right. Um, I was going to say that I'm not suffering well, y'all. So you do have to suffer. Yeah. And that's one thing I was asking Bree to pray with me about. Because uh, Christ said we're going to suffer. And I will always be with Christ. I will suffer well. But when I say I'm going to suffer for him, because I'm, I'm not going nowhere. That's just who I am. I will give my life for Christ. That's just me. But when I say I'm not suffering well, I mean here in this life because I'm human, right? I ain't used to, uh, well, I wouldn't have died for y'all because we all be y'all. All y'all be dead because I wouldn't have gave my life. So, you know, I ain't the one who to be doing all the suffering. But I know he said, he told me I'm going to suffer. And I, you know, but, but, but he doesn't give you more than you can bear, right? He already said he's going to give you a way of escape. But my thing is, suffering ain't easy. It don't feel good. But in that suffering, you're getting pruned. You're getting refined. Hopefully, hopefully, if you're in the Word and you're doing what you're supposed to do, and if you're in the Word and you're following God, then you're getting pruned. You're getting refined. That's where your growth come in. That's where revelation, God will give you truth. All you got to do is ask for you. And then you got to listen. And then you got to be patient. And that's it. Yeah, absolutely. I, so that was a good word. It, it, it was strong, but yet me, I, I got a whole lot of it. I received a whole lot out, me of, too. Out, out of that. I really did. Because it, it doesn't matter, you know. We all got to grow. We're never going to evolve until we get to heaven. Right. We think we know it, but we don't know. We don't know. God changes all the time. All the time. Well, no, God don't change. But he will give us revelations to things that are going to be different. And you're yes. not going to see things the same way because your perception is different. Because your mind is different. Mm -hmm. You have the mind you of Christ. Renew your mind. You're supposed Every to renew day. your mind. That's right. When you renew your mind, things are different. You're not going to think the same way. And, and you know, when it comes to false gods, we all worshiping and serving a false god somewhere. But now the big G-O-D, because the one thing you got to have in common is you got to have an absolute. God is the absolute. But you and I already gave the word. We know how you get there. But we all got to be careful of these little gods. Yeah, absolutely. These idols. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just that's idols. Hope, that's hope, but you know, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Good. You are welcome. Oh, and, well, yeah. That word brought me right on in. Thank you. <laughs> It's good to hear from you too, and see your beautiful face. It's been good to see you. Look at the New Year to sign. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, but that was. You on mute? Uh, yeah, that was um, awesome work, and I know, uh, like she said, that definitely as 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 Christians, I think especially, and I'm just going to separate that. We don't like to suffer, but we know we have to. You know, that's just something we have to go to get us closer to where God wants us and needs us to be. Um, and I, I think about your story and it's funny because I'm doing the Bible again here and the whole Paul, the trap, the conversion from Saul to Paul is just so amazing. I, I, I say, read it. If you have not read that, mm -hmm. because he will never leave us where we are, no matter how far you go, no matter who you hurt, no matter what you do, it don't matter. And when you serve that kind of God. It just gives you a peace about things in your life. Even when you make a mistake. I was going through a situation with a friend. You know, I, Brianna, I shared this with you. And we finally had a, a time to talk. About, and it's like, I don't want to be this person. But I can't help who I am in Christ. I can't help that I have this spirit of love and want to talk and want to forgive. And I need you to forgive. And I need us to be happy. And I, but Michelle, I don't want to do that. I don't, I don't want to do any of that. I want to be where I'm at. I don't care if I talk to you. I don't care if you go. You know, I didn't care. But the Jesus in me. But even in that, God did not leave me where I was. Even in that spirit that I was in, he did not leave me there because he wants all of me. He wants that all that he puts in me to be able to give it to someone else. And if it's in me, if it's in me, then that means I'm supposed to give it to someone else because it's not just for me. 
My healing was not just for me. You know what I'm saying? The love I have, the, the giving, the, the nice, the sweet, whatever God put in me is not for me. It's so that I can bring someone else in. So to be in a place where I feel like I'm hindering somebody, I had to check myself, even though I didn't want to, but I'm so thankful that God don't leave me in my mess. Because I ain't always right. You know, I you know we ain't always right, but I am so thankful that he don't leave us leave me there. I am I am thankful for this life. You know, they don't always what I want it to be. I think that he supplies the needs that I have though. And I'm very thankful for that. So that was awesome, awesome word. And thank you for that. Thank you for that word. Yeah, really you, good. you are welcome. Thank you both for sharing. But I was gonna say, um, I'd rather suffer for Christ than just be suffering just to be suffering because I got myself in something. I can't figure out how to get myself out. Amen. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, like I'd rather suffer the way he needs me to suffer for his glory, you know, so that I'm not just suffering outside of his will. I want to suffer in his will, whatever that consists of, whatever, however much pain, however much trials, however many mountains, however many storms. Yeah we must suffer it's just it's not fun but the scripture every time i see the word suffer i always am reminded of the scripture when he says even though you suffer for a little you're going to suffer for a little while but he will strengthen you and restore you and place you back on a firm foundation after this message or in this message saw after he had suffered and he didn't even really suffer just yet. But when he has suffered, God strengthened him by bringing him food or food was brought to him, should I say. But he got replenished of his strength, you know. So when you are going to suffer, because I'm sure that was suffering for him, honestly, the fasting for three days and praying to somebody who he didn't even know. He thought lies about him, you know, so having to just three days suffer. For Christ is better than suffering a lifetime without him, you know, or suffering an eternity without him. So, yeah, and then I get to get my treasures. Okay, okay. Treasures. I'm, I'm, I'm collecting my stuff. Collecting every jewel in a ruby, <laughs> okay? Sure. All of them. Yes, yeah, All absolutely. I can't wait. So, yeah. you know, but we yeah. we rather suffer in that way. So, um, did anybody else want to share um, before we pray out, um, I'll give you a minute. If not, then we are gonna go.